Orlando is one of the largest destinations for tourism throughout the world. It's a place defined by entertainment, retail, dining, and of course, theme parks. It's a place that saw the introduction of Disney as the catalyst for growth, but has since become far larger, welcoming a number of other attractions into its fold. It's a major hub of commerce, of entertainment, and of vacation. Still, I think it's only going to be getting larger. Universal is currently building its third Orlando Park, Epic Universe, which I suspect will lead to substantial growth and development around it. I'm not sure if people really seem to understand the possibilities of what a third Universal Park will do, not just to their competition, but in creating a new hub of entertainment in Orlando. Today I would like to break down this new park, taking a look at its possible attractions and seeing how it will grow Universal Orlando Resort into a much more significant destination. Consequently, I want to take a look at how this will affect the surrounding area, expanding current entertainment outside of the theme parks, and creating a whole new experience if you're visiting the city. If you thought Orlando was big before, well, it's about to get a whole lot bigger. Highway 192 is a long stretch of road, located right outside of Walt Disney World. It's an area that is known for abandoned buildings and sketchy motels. Generally, if you are looking to travel to Orlando and vacation at Disney, but not stay at one of their resorts, you would probably find some place along Highway I-4 or International Drive. Yet, 192 used to be the thriving center of tourism near Orlando providing many attractions and motels that would entertain and house people outside of Disney property. While it still does host a fair number of attractions, most notable of which is Medieval Times, the glory days of 192 are long gone. Instead, most attractions that exist are rather cheap and gimmicky, not unlike many of the iconic gift shops that still sit along the road. So, what happened? Well, I'm sure many people watching have heard this story before, but when the Magic Kingdom opened in 1971, Disney only built three resorts. That would be the Polynesian, the Contemporary, and the Fort Wilderness Campgrounds. This was Disney's first attempt at the hotel business, with the leadership being rather unsure of how to even run their own resorts effectively. 192 would pick up the slack, building motels to address capacity that Disney couldn't. In addition to this, many also saw the opportunity to open restaurants and roadside attractions, hoping to bring in some of those tourist dollars for themselves. Disney leadership, pre-Michael Eisner, didn't see these other businesses as competitors. Whether it be other theme parks like SeaWorld or Splendid China, or the variety of other attractions within Orlando, Disney leadership often saw these as helping attendants for the Magic Kingdom. I think that they were very much correct and that while Disney was the primary draw to the area, these other businesses gave people another reason to view Orlando as a vacation destination when they otherwise may not have done so. Even when Epcot would open in 1982, the same attitude persisted. Yet, when Eisner would step into the company and become CEO in 1984, his approach was very different. He thought that Disney could offer their own version of experiences done by their competitors, but in a way that was higher quality and uniquely Disney. 
Eisner helped push forward the in-development Living Seas Pavilion for Epcot as competition with SeaWorld. The plans for the original Universal Studios Florida were essentially stolen and manifested as Disney MGM Studios in 1989, hoping to discourage Universal from building its Florida park. Animal Kingdom was partially designed as a competitor to Busch Gardens Tampa, Disney's various water parks were intended to make Wet n Wild irrelevant, and Pleasure Island at Downtown Disney were major draws away from Orlando retail and nightlife. So too would Disney expand heavily into the hotel business in the 1990s, also introducing Disney Vacation Club as Disney's version of a timeshare program. While many of Disney's hotels were quite expensive, they also introduced value pricing with the all-star resorts, really offering options for people of a variety of income levels. While this hurt the motels and resorts of 192 pretty badly, the introduction of the Magical Express in 2005 was the final nail in the coffin. It would take visitors directly from the Orlando International Airport to Disney property for free if the guests were staying in one of their many resorts. By eliminating the cost of a car rental, it worked as an enticing perk to keep people on Disney property exclusively, further reducing demands for the attractions located on and around 192. Today, this stretch of highway is a sad shell of its former self. It's not completely dead, but it really only exists to service tourists of low income, many of which live their vacations through cheap restaurants and gift shops that specialize in knockoff theme park merchandise. It's an interesting side to Disney history that often isn't spoken about. The success of 192 could only exist with the rise of Disney, but it was also destroyed by them as well. It serves as an interesting lesson, because just north of SeaWorld, but south of Universal, is another significant stretch of road, International Drive. Where 192 has failed, iDrive has instead grown despite its larger neighbors, and I suspect that we're going to see major changes happening with the introduction of Universal's new park. Juxtaposed to 192, I'm inclined to think that iDrive will quickly become the new hub of entertainment in Orlando, in addition to other entertainment districts and complexes rising up nearby. To first understand why this will likely be the case though, we have to understand where Universal's new park is located and why it will be so significant in boosting Orlando tourism. Before I continue, a lot of time and effort goes into producing videos like these. I've made the observation that if I just simply ask people to kindly hit the like button, the videos do end up with far more traction. If you like stuff like this, I also strongly encourage you to subscribe and hit the bell icon to receive notifications of new uploads as well. Universal Orlando Resort currently hosts two parks, Universal Studios Florida and Islands of Adventure. The resort also includes CityWalk, which acts as a central hub of the property, offering shopping, dining, and entertainment, as well as transportation to Universal's seven resorts, six of which are located on the main parcel of land. The other resort is Universal's Endless Summer, which is the budget option located at the intersection of I Drive and Universal Boulevard, so still within busing or even walking distance. Last, Universal also offers a highly themed water park, Volcano Bay, which opened relatively recently in 2017. While the overall resort offers quite a bit, it still obviously lacks the scope and scale of Walt Disney World. Still, while Universal has the second best attendance numbers for visited theme parks in Orlando, Disney has generally been regarded as the untouchable primary destination, with Universal often being included as a side trip and longer vacations. Yet, it's clear that the resort has been working to change this through aggressive expansion, both within its parks and with four of its hotels being built within the last eight years as of the making of this video. In 2010, with the opening of the Wizarding World of Harry Potter, Universal managed to steal about 4% of the theme park market share from Disney, leaving both with the realization that Disney wasn't so untouchable. Since then, Universal has been building new attractions or replacing old ones, though the reception has been rather mixed. 
I don't need to tell you that Fast and Furious Supercharged is one of the worst received attractions in the world. Still, since 2019, Universal has opened a slate of incredible attractions, both at its Orlando parks and around the world, revealing that the company has found its footing in the creative process once again, allowing me to feel highly optimistic for what Epic Universe will offer. Not to take anything away from Disney's water parks, but Volcano Bay also makes them look rather outdated, as they've seen very little investment since opening. Volcano Bay itself, while a lesser draw than the theme parks, helps round out the resort as a complete package that feels like it exists within its own bubble in Orlando. That being said, Universal has now essentially run out of space, but has a large pot of land located just east of I Drive, which is where the new park will be located. While Universal has announced very little in regard to what attractions will be included and what the themes will be, Alicia Stella at Theme Park Stop publishes videos concerning permits filed by Universal through the city of Orlando, as well as discussing strong rumors on what will be contained within the park. While it should be noted that most of what I'm going to speak about is rumor, I can say that I do trust her as a reliable source, and I'm about to essentially summarize what she has said through her videos. I strongly recommend checking her channel out, especially if you want detailed information on the development of the park, so I will leave a link in the description below. Judging from the concept art, Epic Universe will naturally have an overarching and abstract universe theme as part of its hub area. According to Alicia, it seems like the hub will probably be split into different elemental sections, representing abstract and nebulous renditions of themes like water, wind, fire, or space. The hub will of course offer shopping and dining, but possibly a small number of attractions as well. These seem to be a few interesting and unique flat rides, although there is very much a lengthy dueling coaster included in the concept art. Off of the hub will be a number of different self-contained lands though. Starting from the left and moving clockwise, the first land is Super Nintendo World, which is the only officially confirmed area from Universal. While I'm not going to get into the details of everything, the land itself first opened in 2021 at Universal Japan. From what I've seen on video, it looks ridiculously well-themed, immersive, and interactive, also including two attractions. The first is a Mario Kart Dark Ride, where visitors will put on augmented reality headgear that overlays with the physical ride portions. The second attraction will be Yoshi's Adventure, a slow-moving Omnimover ride that is mostly outside but provides unique views of the land and show scenes that can only be viewed from the attraction. While not the most exciting, I think of it as something more akin to the Sky Trolley in Seuss Landing, something which I find to be underrated yet enjoyable for what it is. While not yet built in Japan, there will eventually be a Donkey Kong themed expansion that will include a minecart roller coaster. This will likely open with Super Nintendo World when Epic Universe opens. The next land is rumored to be based around Universal Monsters. Before Harry Potter and the Forbidden Journey was built at Islands of Adventure, that particular expansion plot was rumored to possibly house a Van Helsing attraction within Dracula's Castle, using the Kuka Arm technology eventually seen in Forbidden Journey. The current rumor for this land is that the Anchor attraction will be revisiting and revising this idea. The land itself is likely going to be themed to a village, with Alicia putting forward the idea that a potential theater show was cancelled and instead replaced with a spinning coaster. The land itself also has an expansion plot, with the prevailing rumor being an eventual boat ride themed to the creature from the Black Lagoon. If we work our way back into the hub, the back of the park is dominated by a large new hotel that allows guests to just simply walk into the park without going through the entrance. More on that later though. The next land will likely be an expansion of the Wizarding World, and according to Alicia, will probably be based on the streets of Paris, leading into the French version of the Ministry of Magic from the Fantastic Beasts films. From there, guests will enter through the fireplaces of the Flu Network and find themselves in the British Ministry of Magic, where some type of ambitious attraction will be located. This area also has the potential to offer other attractions, such as a possible virtual reality experience that simulates flying on a broom, as well as a potential indoor theater. 
I'm sure it's a safe bet to assume that wand magic will work as an interactive component here as well. The final opening land is rumored to be themed to How to Train Your Dragon, featuring a large outdoor roller coaster, as well as some smaller scale attractions, flat rides, and stage shows. Without having gone through all of her articles and videos, I believe that I have presented the information reported by Alicia accurately, though again, I would like to emphasize that these are rumors, and even if true, are subject to change before the park opens. While a third park on Universal property is great though, I think it will have a larger impact than people seem to expect. I believe it will lead to Universal not just becoming a true competitor to Disney and opening new doors for the resort, but will affect the entire surrounding community as well, resulting in a major expansion of I Drive and helping to boost the popularity of other entertainment districts already in development, resulting in Orlando becoming an even more attractive and exciting place to visit. If 192 died because Disney became so big though, why would the opposite happen with Universal? Well, let's segue into that next. Quickly returning to the back of the new park, Universal filed a trademark for Universal's Helios Grand Hotel as reported by Alicia, likely alluding to this particular tower, indicating a possible sun or star theme that would fit in with the hub. To the south and just in front of the park entrance, permits have also been filed for other hotels, also indicating a space theme. Overall, Universal's new plot of land is large enough not just for a pretty large number of hotels, but also a potential new entertainment district akin to CityWalk, and even a fourth park. As part of the new phase of the resort, Universal has also worked with the city of Orlando, helping to pay for an extension of Kirkman Road with dedicated bus lanes, connecting both parts of the resort and allowing Universal guests to travel easily and quickly between them. In addition, Alicia has also reported that the new park will also have a large back-of-house area that is capable of servicing both parts of the resort. What I'm speculating on is that this potentially allows the current parks to expand, potentially demolishing current back-of-house areas and creating new space for lands and attractions. The point I'm attempting to make is that I think that this fundamentally changes how people will see the resort. Whereas many people now go to Disney as their primary destination and often treat Universal as a side trip, I think that the introduction of Epic Universe could change people's perceptions of Universal Orlando as a multi-day destination. With the park, I suspect that a number of new hotels will open with it, and Universal will continue building new ones over the next decade or so. While Volcano Bay isn't necessarily the primary draw for people currently visiting, it too will play a role in encouraging people to stay longer on Universal property, now that they see the potential need to stay at least three days for the other parks. It also appears that Volcano Bay has space for a possible expansion, something that could really work to solidify it as a must-see attraction and really encouraging a fourth day as well. As long as the quality of the parks remains competitive, I think that visiting Universal will evolve beyond just the idea of a side trip and into a real decision on where to spend vacation time. With three main parks and Volcano Bay, multiple hotel options, and a large degree of interconnectivity, it definitely changes the equation for many people. I have a feeling that Disney really underestimates their competition, and they could see a pretty significant loss in market share because of this. If you haven't seen my other videos, I've been quite the vocal critic of Disney because I've seen the quality of their parks decline so rapidly. In their desperation to chase the success of the Wizarding World, they've gone all in on destroying the thematic cohesion and uniqueness of their parks in favor of poorly shoehorned intellectual property, substituting familiarity with pop culture rather than actual interesting or compelling attraction design. I have no love for Toy Story Land or this new cartoony Epcot overhaul. Even Galaxy's Edge is rather underwhelming to me, existing to sell merchandise rather than experience. That's a fundamental difference between Disney and Universal, and that while the Wizarding World of course inspires food and merchandise sales, it does so in a way that is immersive and adds to the overall experience you're having within the land. 
With Universal, the quality of the experience is meant to provoke the sale of merchandise, but at Disney it feels the opposite. Galaxy's Edge instead feels like a land built for Instagram promotion, mocking interesting elements or the interactivity of Potter or Super Nintendo World. Instead, it serves as a backdrop for retail, rather than providing merchandise that adds to the world it's trying to sell you. I've discussed this numerous times and so I'm sick of reiterating it, but my point is that Disney is getting sloppy and their parks are becoming boring. Universal, of course, also relies very heavily on the implementation of IP as well, but it never takes precedence over the actual attraction experience. The Born Stuntacular, which opened in 2020, is a great example, providing a compelling and technically impressive show that is based on a property that has softer appeal. Even something with significantly more impact like Jurassic World, Universal clearly designed great attractions first and focused on the iconography of the world second. This factors into why I think that Epic Universe will also draw a lot of people away from Disney. Universal's track record for excellent attraction design over the last three years has been really impressive, and when the Disney parks and their overall experience has started to decline so quickly, I have no doubt that Universal is just waiting to poach their guests with what I suspect is a really strong park. Still, once the new park and property becomes available to the public, visitors will find themselves not just with theme parks, but with a whole interconnected entertainment district of International Drive, hosting numerous attractions and restaurants within walking distance and with plenty of transportation options available. International Drive came to be in the early 1970s, developed by a man named Finley Hamilton, who would open a motel called the Hilton Inn South in 1970. At the time, Hamilton was taking a gamble, anticipating that his motel would provide rooms for people visiting the Magic Kingdom, which would open just a year later. Because the motel was essentially located on a dirt road, Hamilton would pave it and eventually name it International Drive thinking that the important sounding name would attract people to his business. While a bit further away than 192, it did find success and eventually expanded. North of its intersection with Sand Lake Road, it became known for motels and tacky souvenir gift shops. To the south, SeaWorld would open in 1973, and Wet n Wild would open to the north in 1977, placing the strip right between them. Universal also entered the scene in 1990, then eventually purchasing Wet n Wild and closing it in 2016, where it has now been replaced with the Endless Summer Resort. Obviously, in addition to its close proximity to Disney, being located between major attractions was a huge factor in the development of the area. To the south, city officials had what they thought was the perfect location for a convention center located just north of SeaWorld, which they thought would be a huge boon to the local economy. The first building would open in 1983, and has since gone through major expansion, creating a whole district of convention space and upper-class hotels that currently sees around 1.4 million people each year. Connecting these two districts and appealing to both tourists and convention attendees alike, property owners developed the area into more hotels, retail, and restaurant space that is continuing to evolve. iDrive is extremely close to Universal's new park, it runs parallel to the easily walkable Universal Boulevard, which will be an access route to the new property. It's important to note that while iDrive is highly pedestrian friendly, it also has its own transportation system called the iRide Trolley, which takes people up and down the strip quickly. Despite the extremely close proximity to the strip, Universal's hotels on their new property will probably be a significant walk for those who are staying on site but want to visit iDrive. Despite this though, they are close enough that they could drive there within a few minutes, and I can even see the expansion of the trolley route to Universal property. Whereas 192 was strangled through Disney's huge expansion into the hotel business and the introduction of the Magical Express, I strongly feel that Universal's development will have the opposite effect. Part of the reason for this is because Universal has shown support for the expansion of Brightline, 
a rail system that aims to connect Central and South Florida. As it currently exists, Brightline is just finishing a route between Miami and the Orlando International Airport, with a train terminal set to open in 2023. Currently, Phase 2 of the plan is to run a route from the airport into Disney Springs, continuing on from there to Tampa. With this being the case, there is another proposal, one being fought for by the city of Orlando as well as Universal, bringing a route through the city into the Orange County Convention Center right off of I-Drive. This would be a much more expensive option that would take longer to implement, and of course it has been met with resistance, most notably from Disney. Still, a rail route to this area would be incredibly convenient for tourists who wouldn't have to worry about transportation from the airport. This station would likely include bus transportation to Universal as well as to SeaWorld, creating a new entertainment hub in Orlando. With that being said, let's actually take a look at what iDrive currently offers and see how it could evolve through the boost in tourism from Universal's new park. In February 2016, the Orange County Planning Division published a document intended to guide the development of iDrive through 2040. I was able to get my hands on some of these materials thanks to Alicia Stella, so I would like to first thank her for pointing me in the right direction. According to this document, Orange County has divided the area into seven different districts, although I'm going to interpret it a little bit differently, trying to instead view it as if through the eyes of a tourist visiting the area. At the south end, just north of SeaWorld, that's where you will find the Orange County Convention Center and its various hotels. It's a really nice and pleasant area even just to walk around, but it doesn't offer any attractions other than what's being hosted in the convention space. This area is where the station for Brightline would be located if it does end up coming to fruition, which in itself would centralize visitor traffic in Orlando to this area, even if Universal wasn't building its third park. People attending conventions generates over $3 billion worth of revenue within the city every year, so I can understand why an easy access rail line directly from the airport to this area would be beneficial to everyone. Moving north along I Drive and stopping at the intersection with Sand Lake Road, this area hosts a number of hotels as well as restaurants, retail, and attractions. I like to refer to this as the gentrified area of I Drive as we will see that it completely changes once you cross Sand Lake. Starting from the south, there's an entertainment and restaurant development called The Point, hosting a large regal movie theater as well as retail and upscale chain restaurants. Below the theater is a large space called Main Event Entertainment, a location that serves food and has bowling and an arcade. Having gone through a recent renovation, the area still seems a bit... vacant? and every time I've gone, very much a ghost town. However, I anticipate that it probably sees much higher attendance during dinner hours on weekends, and probably sees substantial business during conventions. It's a development that was hit hard during the 2020 shutdown, but there do seem to be signs of people returning. Continuing north, this district of iDrive also hosts various chain restaurants, ranging from the Olive Garden to Bahama Breeze to TGI Fridays. On the west side of the street, Dave & Buster's is a relatively new development, offering a large arcade and dining, and working as direct competition to main event. Nearby, there is also Orlando Heli Tours, providing rather cheap helicopter flights over I Drive and the surrounding area. The developments in this district are also hotel-heavy, most notable of which is the Castle Hotel. I've never stayed there, but I am curious as to what it's like inside. This district of iDrive also has various attractions, ranging from the upside-down facade of Wonderworks, and the curiously similar Ripley's Believe It or Not Museum, designed to look like it's falling into a sinkhole. The Ice Bar is a novelty nightclub, serving fire and ice-themed drinks through its various rooms, one of which is kept at freezing temperatures, and is actually made up of ice blocks and sculptures. Nearby is iFly, an indoor skydiving venue. Other attractions include Sleuth's Mystery Theater dinner shows, 
as well as Mango's Tropical Cafe, also hosting dinner shows in addition to a nightclub. Most notable in this district of iDrive is Icon Park, hosting more restaurants and retail, but also some significant attractions as well. Most iconic is what is simply known as the Wheel, offering views of the surrounding area at 400 feet and allowing you to see as far as Walt Disney World in addition to the other surrounding theme parks. This building also contains Madame Tussauds Wax Museum, a surprisingly entertaining attraction for something outside of a theme park. On the other side of the building is the Sea Life Aquarium, which is quite deceptive, being larger than you would probably anticipate. It too is also a high quality attraction worth checking out. Just outside of the main building, Icon Park recently opened the Museum of Illusions, which is meant more for Instagram than it is an actual museum, but it can be bundled in with other attractions located in the development as well. Other rides are going to include the Starflyer, which is the world's tallest swing ride. It's not something that I ever intend to get on, but I do like how it creates kinetic energy for the area and has itself become an icon of iDrive. In late December of 2021, Icon Park also opened the world's tallest drop tower and the world's largest slingshot simultaneously. Again, while these are not attractions that I will get on, I did like the idea of them helping to further reinforce Icon Park as a desirable destination until a very unfortunate incident happened in late March of this year. While the investigation is still ongoing, a 14-year-old boy did pass after slipping out from under the restraint, falling quickly to the ground. I don't want to focus on this incident, but I can't speak about Icon Park and not mention it. If you're wary of the wheel or the Starflyer, do take note that these are run by different organizations than the Drop Tower and the Slingshot. The rest of this district is defined by more restaurants and retail, really offering something for everyone. However, when you reach Sand Lake Road and cross to the northern district of I Drive, the area becomes a bit more like 192. Most notable is the world's largest McDonald's, which while not nearly as themed or interesting as it used to be, still is quite unique and worth a visit if you're looking for something novel. They even have a dessert counter and pizza if that's something that you want to try. Along this part of the strip, you can find abandoned buildings and attractions. This was the area first developed in the 1970s, becoming infamous for its taggy gift shops with knockoff merchandise and cheap restaurants, and you can definitely see remnants of this today. I wouldn't say that this area is necessarily unsafe, but it is definitely more run down and caters to visitors of lower income, also coming off as a bit seedy. The area was also hit pretty hard in the 2020 shutdown and hasn't seemed to recover since. That being said, there are still some interesting attractions and nicer areas located on this side of the road. The Titanic Museum as well as Gator Golf still seem to be open and look interesting, even though I haven't experienced them. Down one road, close to some nicer hotels, you can also find the Pirate's Dinner Adventure, a show similar in concept to Medieval Times. It has been a really long time since I've been there, but I do recall it being interesting and probably worth a visit. Now closed, the Magical Midway was a staple of Orlando tourist culture, existing as a small amusement park alongside the street. It was notable for having pretty extensive go-kart tracks, as well as a fair number of rides. Still, as Icon Park came into its own, the park suffered from a lack of attendance It was finally killed with the 2020 shutdown. Currently, you can still visit the Slingshot, and there is a small arcade still apparently open. Otherwise, the place looks ready to be demolished, and I wouldn't doubt that that's coming soon. As theme parks become more expensive and the middle class is slowly but surely shrinking in the United States, the north end of iDrive is only just struggling to hold on. It's too cheap for people who view the area as disreputable, 
but traveling to Orlando is currently a bit too expensive for those of lower income. I anticipate that in the future, these developments will be bought up and rebuilt into nicer accommodations and attractions, just like the district south of Sands Lake. Still, the future of iDrive and the surrounding area looks bright, so let's now see what the future might hold and speculate how Universal's new park will play into this. Orlando is one of the fastest growing metropolitan areas in the world. Its attractions, restaurants, and retail not only appeal to tourists, but to the droves of people who are now living here or plan to move. This allows many new developments to be financially stable, having to fight less for tourist dollars and relying on consistent patronage from local residents. This can be seen with the new area O-Town West, introducing Florida's first White Castle, which has undoubtedly been a success. The shopping center has also introduced Portillo's Hot Dogs, a 1950s-themed fast-food restaurant with only a few other Florida locations, making it a novelty here. Located in another retail district just south of SeaWorld and north of Disney, a plot of land was purchased by Area 15, known for its experiential retail and artistic entertainment complex in Las Vegas. One of the most notable aspects of this is an art exhibit developed by a company known as Meow Wolf, creating explorable and trippy art exhibits in various locations throughout the United States. When I first heard of these, I thought to myself that this would probably do really well in Orlando, and I think it's a safe bet to predict that this new Area 15 complex will probably get one. Currently, the plan is to start construction in 2022 and open to the public sometime in 2024. The point I would like to make with this is that Orlando is continuing to expand it won't be stopping anytime soon. Coming back to iDrive, we have seen some development recently. The plot of land where Universal is currently building Epic Universe was previously owned by them back in the early aughts. According to Orlando Weekly, Universal's parent company at the time, Vivendi, was going through some serious financial trouble and sold the 1,800 acres of land to a Georgia developer named Stan Thomas for the sum of $70 million in 2003. His intent was to develop the land into luxury resorts. A year later, Universal was sold to NBC, which has since been bought by Comcast. In 2015, Thomas lost much of the land to a $285 million foreclosure, with Universal snatching up most of the individual plots. However, other developers bought smaller parcels of land, and alongside Universal Boulevard today, you have the relatively new Topgolf and Andretti indoor go-karts, just in case there wasn't enough entertainment in Orlando. While these are located on the other side of I Drive, they are still within easy walking or driving distance. Speculating on the future of I Drive, I think that we should start here. Of the land purchased, 40 acres are owned by Ripley's Entertainment, where it has been speculated that they will move their headquarters onto the property and create a large entertainment complex along with it. One speculated attraction could be a Ripley's Aquarium, which, if you weren't aware, they're just simply large aquarium complexes under the Ripley's brand. As someone who likes aquariums, I would be highly interested. It would also be pretty significant for the area, helping to again solidify it as the entertainment hub of Orlando and being within easy walking and driving distance of Universal's new campus. That being said, with the 2020 shutdown, whatever plans were in place for this were either cancelled or put on hold. Still, I can't imagine that Ripley's won't build something, especially since they directly share a border with Universal's property. Across the street from the iDrive McDonald's, there were plans for a new entertainment development known as the Skyplex. It has been in a developmental limbo since 2012, but the idea was that it will be an indoor amusement and water park, anchored by a 570-foot-tall skyscraper featuring a roller coaster. This particular coaster would feature either a vertical lift hill or launch, then spiraling down the tower into what would have certainly been a unique experience. 
However, the project kept getting pushed back due to financial trouble and resistance from Universal, stating that the skyscraper would ruin sightlines in their parks, specifically from the Wizarding World. However, it appears that the plans eventually evolved, with Lionsgate instead taking over and revising the complex into a resort, using their intellectual property to theme the rides. This was reported in 2020, though I'm sure that plans were put on hold or cancelled because of the shutdown and the uncertainty that it brought. Still, theme parks and tourism have bounced back significantly since then, and I have to imagine that there are at least considerations in reviving this idea. While there doesn't appear to be much else in the way of announced development for iDrive, I have to imagine that we will start to see things pick back up, especially with Epic Universe on the way. I wouldn't be surprised if the north side of the Strip saw certain plots of land sold and buildings demolished, being replaced with newer and nicer developments instead. The Orange County Roadmap for iDrive development also had many goals in mind for the future of the street. Among these was more accessible walkability, as well as plentiful green space in the intentional design of aesthetically pleasing architecture. As the district expands east to Universal Boulevard with the new park and other attractions, the pedestrian accessibility and green space will be essential in keeping the area desirable and pleasant to visit. There is also a drive to reform parking, instead pursuing parking garages and freeing up current parking lots for newer development and complexes. This has already started to happen, and I'm optimistic for the future of this area. I think then that Universal's new park will completely change Orlando, helping it to grow and inspiring new developments. Evolving Universal into a connected multi-day destination and resort with what I suspect will be world-class attractions really puts serious pressure on Disney. With seemingly no response to this, I have a feeling that this area of Orlando will see a significant boost in tourism as people come to check out Universal's new offerings. Still, because of its central location between the two campuses, International Drive will also see those tourist dollars as well. If Universal wants to expand CityWalk or create a new entertainment district on its eastern property, I suspect that they will have a lot of competition. iDrive is already pretty successful because of its close proximity to both SeaWorld and Universal's main campus, but it will eventually become a huge entertainment district connecting all of Universal. It already does really well because of all the money brought in from conventions, so I have to imagine that we will see a slate of new plans and developments over at least the next decade or so, as this is definitely a prime location, creating a new hub of entertainment and driving visitor traffic away from Walt Disney World. In addition to this, the possible introduction of Brightline would create easy and affordable transportation between Miami, people flying into Orlando, and Tampa only consolidating people into this area further and opening it up to visitors who would otherwise have stayed only on Disney property. Outside of iDrive, plenty of development is already happening, indicating that Orlando Entertainment is only going to continue to expand. The possibilities of what will be coming is exciting, whether it's Universal's new offerings, Disney's possible response, or the revitalization and expansion of the surrounding area. I look back to the sad but fascinating 192, a place that seems like the ideal location to scoop up tourists' money, but decayed under the shadow of Disney. I have no doubt that we're now going to see the opposite happen, as Universal's new park will completely change the landscape of Orlando. If you enjoy these types of videos, I would like to again ask you to leave a like, as it really helps the channel out. As always, please consider subscribing and hitting the bell icon so as to be alerted to new videos when they're released.